Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 104, The Making of Holstein. In today's episode, we finally get closer to the history of the Hanseatic League. We'll take a look at some of the fundamental changes in the Saxon policy towards the East that were ushered in during the reign of Lothar of Sublinburg and shaped events for a long period thereafter. It is in these decades that the Saxon magnates will realize that raiding and plundering the lands east of the Elbe is no longer the financially most attractive option. A great organized migration from the overpopulated Rhineland, Holland and Flanders into northern Germany begins. What we will look at specifically is the county of Holstein and its brand new counts, the Lords of Schauenburg. These ambitious and proactive family will develop these lands and found or refound two of the most significant cities of the Hanseatic League, Lübeck and Hamburg. But before we start, let me tell you that the History of the Germans podcast is advertising free, thanks to the generous support from patrons. And you can become a patron too and enjoy exclusive bonus episodes and other privileges from the price of a latte per month. All you have to do is sign up at patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or on my website historyofthegermans.com. You'll find all the links in the show notes. And thanks a lot to Anders B, Sherilyn B, Philippe A and Andreas A who've already signed up. Now last week we talked about Lothar of Supplenburg and how he transformed the political structure of the Duchy of Saxony, turning it from a loose federation under a nominal duke into a much more centralized entity. Part of his success was down to his HR policy. He installed loyal men into key positions, often by disregarding the wishes of his emperor Henry V, who he had comprehensively defeated at the Battle of Westenholz. These men, and at this stage I'm afraid these are all men, will found dynasties that will determine the fate of Northern Europe for centuries to come. And these are Conrad of Wettin, whose family will become the electors of Saxony and ultimately kings of Poland, Albrecht de Baer, who will create the Margraviate of Brandenburg and whose family, the Ascania or Dukes of Anhalt, will rule the lands of Saxon-Anhalt until 1918. Henry the Proud, head of the House of Wealth, whose family will be best known to the Anglo-Saxon listeners as the kings of Hanover and then the kings of England. The fourth of these men was Adolf of Schauenburg, who was given the county of Holstein, and Holstein is what we'll talk about today. Geographically, Holstein is the lower part of the Jutland Peninsula, that piece of land that separates the North Sea from the Baltic. Its southern border is the river Elbe and its northern border is the river Eider. Or, to tell you that in the terms of cities that you might know, it stretches from Hamburg to Kiel and from Lübeck to the North Sea coast. Holstein first appears in the historic records when Charlemagne shows up in the 770s. The people who lived north of the Elbe were the most obstinate of the Saxon tribes. To break their resistance, Charlemagne had a large number of them deported to the south. So if you see names like Sachsenheim or Sachsenhausen in Franconia or anywhere else in the south, these may be places where the unfortunates have been brought. And then Charlemagne invited the Slavic Obodrites, specifically the tribe of the Vagrarians, to settle in Holstein. In 811, Charlemagne confirmed Denmark in its control of Schleswig, the territory north of the Eider River. So the idea was that the Vagrarians would form a sort of buffer state, against any invasion by the Danish Vikings. However, by 814, some of the Saxons had returned and Holstein was split between the Slavs in the eastern parts and the Saxon population in the west. Between them lay what Adam of Bremen called the Limes Saxoniae. That was a bit of an exaggeration, suggesting that there was a sort of Hadrian's Wall similar to what the Romans had built to separate them from the Germans. In reality, it was just no man's land between the two populations, made up of bogs and thick forest, with barely any walls or fortifications. Now, these Vagrarian Slavs were part of the Abodrites Federation, the same federation you may remember that was led by our friend Gottschalk. Now, these federations are relatively loose arrangements, and as we will see, the Vagrarians were not always aligned with the other Abodrites. As for the Saxons in the western part of Holstein, they comprised also three distinct groups. There were the Holsten, who gave their name to the county, then the Stormans, who lived around Hamburg, and the Dietmarscher, who settled along the North Sea coast. 
these groups had retained their ancient Germanic traditions well into the 12th century. That means that instead of succumbing to the feudal order under some count or baron, the free peasants of Holstein bowed to no one. They organized their society through the Tings, where all decisions were taken and temporary military leaders were chosen should the need arise. Now, this system of a free peasants' republic persisted in Dietmarschen well into the late 16th century. Interspersed within the western parts of the county were some of the castles initially built and maintained by the Dukes of Saxony and now in fief to the Counts of Schauenburg. In terms of towns or larger villages, well, there was Hamburg. But at the time, Hamburg, despite being formerly the seat of an archbishop, was not much to write home about. The first archbishop, Ansgar, had built a wooden cathedral, but in the subsequent centuries the settlement had been regularly attacked and burned down by Vikings and Slavs, so the population had shrunk to maybe a few hundred, huddled around the sole church that stood on what is today the Domplatz. The major trading centers in the region were Stade, on the western shore of the Elbe, hence not in Holstein, and Heiterbu, the Danish trading port just outside modern-day Schleswig, again, also not in Holstein. Now, the major settlement of the Vagraria Slavs was Oldenburg, and it seems that Plön had also become at least a large village and a castle. And finally, as we have heard in the episode about Gottschalk and Adalbert, the son of Gottschalk and his successor as leader of the Abudrites, Henry, had based himself in Lubice, or Old Lübeck, a Slavic settlement at the mouth of the Trava River, again, just outside the modern city of Lübeck. Now, as for the relationships between all these groups, we can read in Helmut von Bosau that the Saxon communities in Holstein and Sturman were regularly come to the aid of Henry, the prince of the Abodrites, in his conflict with other Slavic tribes, be that the Vagrarians or the Rani. Now, the Rani might be important later. They are the inhabitants of the island of Rügen, and they have replaced the Lutizzi as the guardians of the most important shrine of the pagan deities and general shield-bearer for the old gods. In 1111, this patchwork of peoples and castles was granted to Adolf of Schauenburg as the county of Holstein. Now he was a nobleman from further south. Their castle, the Schaumburg, lay and still lies between Minden and Hanover. The county of Holstein was, to use modern management speak, an opportunity. Not only did the new count have to deal with the Slavic neighbors, the hostile Vagrarians, who had just killed his predecessor, as well as Henry, the powerful prince of the Abudrites. On top of these two, he also had to contend with the local Saxon population that had as much desire to subject themselves to some southern aristocrat as their Slavic neighbors. In terms of resources, he had a handful of castles, and that was pretty much it. And before I forget, his other neighbours, the Archbishop of Hamburg-Bremen and the King of Denmark, both did not much like ducal authority in their backyard either, and that animosity extended to the Duke's vassal, the Count of Holstein. So at this point, the question for the brand new Count is, what shall we do? Until now, standard strategy for a Count put in charge of a territory bordering the Slavic lands was simple. Raise an army, or failing that, a band of thugs, and go burning and plundering in the east. Now this has been going on for nearly 200 years now, and the strategy has sort of run its course. There's only so many times you can steal the same man's purse. Economic activity and population in the Slavic territories has likely shrunk under the permanent onslaught. In particular, after the defeat of the Lutizzi in the 1060s, the Saxons had taken the last large remaining stores of gold held at the temple in Radegast. The only large religious centre and treasure left was now the one on Cap Arcona, on the island of Rügen. Helmut of Bosa tells us that Henry, the prince of the Abudrites, had already picked up some of that treasure when he forced the Rani of Rügen to part with 4,400 marks of silver to avoid their destruction. Plus, Rügen was a long way away from the border and any attack required the consent of Henry, who was after all a Christian and technically an ally. Not only were there no more valuables to be found, the slavery business was also struggling. The end markets, the Muslim kingdoms in Spain and the court of Constantinople had begun their 300-year-long fight for survival. The former against the Reconquista, 
as small Christian kingdoms led crusades south, and the latter against the dual pressure of Turkish tribes and Frankish crusaders. There was simply not much money available for such fripperies as a root and stem eunuch. And then we have the gradual Christianizations of the Slavs, which made it harder to justify the constant raiding. There is a new generation of missionaries heading east. The first waves had been led by guys like Arabert of Prague and Bruno of Querfurt, and they had often been brief and rather ineffective affairs. Its protagonists seemed keener on a spectacular martyr's death than on the actual conversion of the heathens. The next group is better organized and more focused on getting the job done. Two men stand out here, and they could not be more different. On the one hand, there is the Bishop Otto of Bamberg, scion of the Dukes of Meranien. He took it upon himself to convert the Pomeranians, or so we are told. Now, there is some doubt a grand prelate like Otto would actually have spent years going from hovel to hovel, convincing the victims of chivalric brutality that Christianity is the religion of forgiveness and love. This work was probably done by members of his church, whose names are largely lost to history. Still, he staged two missionary journeys into Pomerania, accompanied by 20 priests and a large retinue, that so impressed the locals, 22,000 of them took baptism in one great session in 1128. His counterpart was Visilin, a man, as Helmut of Bozar writes, who was born to parents who were distinguished more by their probity and goodness than by nobility of birth. Translate, poor people. Witzelin has studied in Minden and Paderborn, had led the cathedral school in Bremen, and even went to France to further his studies. Witzelin's first posting as a missionary was in Wippendorf, a nominally Christian village near the no-man's land that Helmond of Bozar described as an empty wasteland full of misguided half-heathens. Visilin founded a monastery there that he called Neumünster, or Neumünster, the name the city has to this day. Witzelin and his comrades did proper missionary work, preaching relentlessly and, where possible, even protect their flock from attacks. Now, Witzelin had initially put his hopes into Henry, the prince of the Abodrites, who was, after all, a Christian, and hence somewhat sympathetic to missionaries. But Henry died before Witzelin really got going, and the two sons of Henry began a civil war that killed both of them. After the last member of the family, a small boy, was murdered, Knut Lavard, one of the claimants to the ever-disputed Danish throne, brought the Abodrites under his control. That did not last long either, since Knut was murdered in the endless Danish succession wars. At that point, the Abodrites split up. One part, the Vegrarians, were led by Pribislav, and the other based around Mecklenburg by Niklot. Neither of them were Christians, and so missionary work slowed down to nothing. In his last act in Holstein, Witzelin convinced the Emperor Lothar to build a castle in Siegeberg. The castle, one of only three mountaintop castles in Schleswig-Holstein, became the key military position where the counts controlled their territory. After that, Witzelin departed to proselytize amongst the Hivellas in the northern marches, where we will meet him again. So, thanks to the efforts of Otto of Bamberg, Witzelin and presumably hundreds of unnamed others, the Slavic peoples of the north had gradually become Christians, making it increasingly difficult to justify attacks on them. So, with the blundering model become less and less attractive, the question arises what to do in its stead. For the Counts of Holstein and many other territorial lords in the East, the answer came from events elsewhere and well outside their control. By the 12th century, the great economic boom that started around 950 through the combination of climate change and improvements in agriculture is slowly petering out. Not that things got worse, just they did not get better at the same rate they did before. Or more precisely, economic growth did not keep pace with population growth. That means cities and villages are still growing in wealth and power, merchants got rich, and tax income for bishops and princes is still expanding. But the average income per head of population did not. The region most impacted by that were Flanders, Holland and the Rhineland. These areas had already been fairly well developed in the beginning of the millennium, and by the early 12th century they had reached the end of the line. 
Most of the forest had been cut down and turned into fields. Wherever it was possible, land had been reclaimed from the sea. The swamps had been drained and the riverbed straightened. Farmers were using modern plows and horses and field management had been refined. At the same time, the traditional landowners who had seen their holdings fragment, be it by inheritance, donations to the church or simple mismanagement, were replaced by more entrepreneurial ones, who reconsolidated holdings and expelled smallholders wherever they could generate more income than the rents they collected. By the 1100s, we find a huge population of landless paupers in the western parts of the empire who are living on day by day, eating only when they find work. Bad harvests and freak weather events, such as the flooding of the recently reclaimed Dutch lowlands, could quickly turn a precarious situation into a catastrophic famine. People are leaving their homes and seek new lands where they could farm and feed their children. Hearing of the vast and by now almost depopulated rich farmland in the east, many are prepared to leave to seek their fortunes. The first wave of migrants we hear about dates back to 1106. The Archbishop of Hamburg, Frederick I, signed an agreement with a group of settlers allowing them to take land between the Weser and the Elbe rivers. This had been uninhabited swampland that was regularly flooded when the tidal Elbe and Weser river breached its banks. The Dutch and Flemish immigrants had experience with building dams and ditches and the idea was that they could drain these lands and make them fertile. The deal set out that each settler would get a very long and thin strip of land, 140 meters wide and 3,400 meters long. This he would hold as a tenant with a right to pass the tenancy to his descendants. The initial rent was extremely generous, at just one penny a year, and they were released from paying the tithe, at least for a time. Where exactly this group went is not explicitly stated, but may have been either in what is today called the Alte Land near Hamburg, or the mouth of the Weser downriver from Bremen. That region is still today called Hollerland, and we know of other settlers' contracts that have been agreed for that area. The settlers were allowed to live by their own rules, had their own lower jurisdiction, their own priests, and probably maintained their language. Many terms they used, in particular as it relates to agriculture and the construction of dikes and ditches, remain in the lower German dialect to this day and so do the shape of their fields. The earliest waves may have been initiated by the desperate people in Holland or Flanders, but the territory rulers in the east quickly realized how profitable these new settlements could be and set up a veritable immigration pipeline. The lord would identify a suitable piece of territory, initially lands that had lain fallow for a long time, either because nobody had ever lived there or the previous Slavic inhabitants had been wiped out in one of these incessant raids of the last centuries. They would then send agents, so-called locators, to the large cities in the west and recruit settlers for this territory, offering terms not dissimilar to what had been offered by Archbishop Frederick. The locator would organize transport and, once the settlers had arrived, the allocation of the strips of land, the supply of materials and seeds, the design of the villages, etc., etc. These guys would then either appoint or become the Schulze, a sort of lower magistrate, mayor of the settlement, who would dispense lower justice and collect the rents and tithes for the territorial lords. If you find village names, not just in Holstein, that have a combination of a first name and Dorf at the end, such as Petersdorf, Zipsdorf, Lübersdorf, these are typically named after the locator who had brought the settlers there. The settlement process in Holstein started on the Elbe River, as Dutch and Flemish immigrants drained the swamps on the northern shore. They built dikes, for instance in Vierlande, south of Hamburg, that turned this empty stretch into a breadbasket, famous for its fruit and vegetables. Other centers of colonization were the no-man's land between the Holstein and the Slavs around Segeberg, Neumünster and Oldesloe. After the Slavic agrarians had been comprehensively defeated in the 1140s, the colonization moved further east. The first settlements were around Eutin and Lütjenburg. Oldenburg and Holstein had been an old Slavic settlement, and you may remember that Gottschalk established a bishopric there that had to be abandoned after his fall. Now the bishop returned and the new church is constructed. After 1160, 
Recruitment spread wider and the locators were sent into Westphalia and Eastphalia as well as the Low Countries. The Westphalians settled further south around Ratzeburg. A church tax inventory gives an idea of the scale of the change. In 1194, the bishopric of Ratzeburg counted 35 villages as payers of tithes in its area. By 1230, 35 years later, this had risen to 125, and in the next 70 years it would grow by another third. Now all of this gets us to the question to what extent these settlements were created at the expense of the Slavic population who had lived there before, a question that is obviously highly contentious. Now as far as we can see, the population density in Holstein was very low at the start of the 12th century. This was frontier country, and as we said, there was a large strip of no man's land between the Saxons and the Slavic people. And there were large areas that were continuously flooded and hence had not been used for agriculture. Now these latter territories are genuinely new lands and not taken from anyone. But as for the no man's lands, well there are two ways to look at it. One way is to argue that these places were empty before the colonists arrived. The other is to say that the constant raids and attacks were the reason population density was low and that these lands were empty. Finally, we can find German villages with names that indicate that they had initially been founded by Slavic peoples. Charles Higonet counted as many as 50 out of the 125 villages that were mentioned in the Ratzeburg Register of 1230. We also hear that the Count Adolf II of Schauenburg had granted the Vagrarians the island of Fehmarn and territories near Oldenburg as some sort of reservation, suggesting they had been expelled from their homes elsewhere. And finally, we find villages with names that start with Wendisch such and such, which indicates that these were Slavic villages within areas now mainly inhabited by German speakers. And finally, we find evidence that in some villages, Slavs and Germans lived side by side. Now, I've seen a lot of comments comparing the colonization of the lands north and east of the Elbe to the colonization of the American West. And sure, there are some similarities, namely the organization of the tracts, the allocation of equal strips of land to the settlers, the perception that the land was empty and the creation of reservations for the indigenous population. But there are also material differences. One fundamental one is that both Slavs and Germans were settled peoples, making a living from agriculture. Hence, what we do not have is an equivalent of the destruction of the herds of American bison as a means to starve out the locals. But that does not mean that there were in periods the process of Eastern colonization in the 12th century descended into outright genocide. One of those was the so-called Wendish Crusade of 1147, initiated by the famous Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, very much my candidate for worst saint ever. The background of the Wendish Crusade had been political. Lothar III's successor, the new king Conrad III, had taken the cross in 1146. His reign had been dominated by his conflict with the House of Welf, led by Henry the Lion, the new Duke of Saxony. So it's another Saxony imperial conflict. Conrad III could not dare to leave for the Holy Land, whilst his adversary remained in the German lands. On the other hand, Henry the Lion had no desire to serve under a king he despised and who had deprived him of his ancestral duchy of Bavaria. To break the gridlock and save his crusade, St. Bernard devised a separate crusade for Henry the Lion and the Saxons to go and convert the heathen Slavs. That crusade, called the Wendish Crusade, would keep both sides apart and busy. Or at least that was the plan. What distinguishes this effort from the previous raids into Slavic territory was the instruction Bernard of Clairvaux issued to the Crusaders. The Crusaders were to receive the same absolution for all their sins on condition that they would not make peace until, quote, either the heathen cult or its nation has been utterly destroyed, end quote. Now, that really is different from what we had before. Before the raids were done for plunder. And as Adam of Bremen stated, there was no mention of Christianity or conversion at all. St. Bernard's instruction is an order to force conversion by the sword and where there is resistance to kill those who refuse. Forced conversion is, by the way, uncanonical. Hence, Catholic sources have tried to reinterpret the instructions as solely an obligation to 
break the nations, i.e. the political infrastructure of the Wends. I doubt that is what Bernard had meant. But then I am biased against pretty much everything he stands for. If you want to contemplate whether this makes a real difference, here is the definition of genocide as set out by the UN. Quote, In the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethical, racial or religious group, as such, killing of members of the group, causing serious bodily harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Unquote. In any event, the crusade started slowly. Many of the participants, including our friends Albrecht de Beer, Konrad von Meissen and Adolf of Schauenburg, were hesitant. Part of that hesitation was because the whole policy framework had already shifted and they all had arrangements with their Slavic neighbours. Mostly the Slavs were paying tribute and had promised not to attack the new settlements. Adolf of Schauenburg had gone furthest and had signed a treaty of friendship with the heathen Niklot, the prince of the Abodrites. Now he tried to find a way through his commitment to the crusade and his obligations to Niklot. In the end, he could not avoid the war. Niklot struck first and destroyed some settlement of the Dutch settlers in Holstein. It seems that Niklot himself had held back, but that the Christian Holstens and Stormans who had allied with him had taken the opportunity to get rid of the new arrivals. When the crusade finally sets out, they were split into two groups one led by Konrad von Meissen and Albrecht de Beer headed for Pomerania. They besieged Dubin with not much vigor and then headed for Stettin. However, Bishop Adalbert of Pomerania, one of the missionaries who had come there with Otto von Bamberg, convinced the crusaders to abandon the siege, so as not to jeopardize the hard work of the saintly bishop. So, they lifted the siege and went back home. In total, this part of the crusade had lasted just a few weeks. The other contingent, led by Henry the Lion, went down to besiege Dobin, a castle Niklot had built as a refuge for his people. Then something very, very unusual happened. According to Helmund of Bosa, the vassals of Henry the Lion went to their duke and said, quote, Isn't this our own land that we're burning down, and our own peoples that we are fighting? Why are we acting as we were our own enemies, destroying our own enemies? incomes. End quote. And that was it. This is one of the vanishing few instances in history where rational economic thought beat religious fanatism. I've been wrecking my brain for another case where an army sent out to fight for whatever ideology is held back by the simple realization that their quest creates more harm than good. So, the Saxons signed an agreement with Niklot. Niklot found some volunteers who were willing to endure some water being spilled over their head and some prayers mumbled, and hey presto, the crusaders declared victory, mass conversion and went home. From that point onwards, the process of colonization goes into overdrive. It's not just the Saxon magnates who give land to immigrants from the West. Slavic princes, as well as the Dukes of Poland, understand the huge benefits these energetic and skilled people can bring to their lands risk of receiving another one-star review bemoaning my referencing modern politics, here's just another example for the fact that immigration is one of the most efficient engines of economic growth. Okay, now let's talk about the scale of the move. Historians estimate the total number of migrants moving east between 1106 and 1250 at around 200,000. That is followed by a second wave of a further 200,000 who go further afield as far south as Transylvania, and as far north as Lithuania. This feels like a small number compared to the roughly 5 million Germans who emigrated to the US between 1820 and 1900, but those made up less than 10% of the total German population. The medieval migration east is estimated to have involved about 7% of the empire's population north of the Alps. That makes it one of the greatest migrations in Europe between the Dark Ages and the 19th century. I am so sorry. This episode has gone on for quite some time now and I will now not get to the refounding of Lübeck and Hamburg. 
we'll do this next week. And that isn't so bad, because it gives us a chance to talk about Henry the Lion, about King Valdemar of Denmark and his best mate Absalom, who inadvertently give Lübeck their first break, and we'll talk about the origins of the Duchy of Mecklenburg. Now, I hope you find this interesting and you're going to join us again. If you have comments on these episodes, for instance, you want me to go faster or slower, more detailed, less detailed, less jokes, more jokes, better jokes, leave a comment on my website or on the Q&A option on Spotify. And before I go, let me thank all of you who are supporting the show, in particular the patrons who have kindly signed up on patreon.com slash historyofthegermans. It is thanks to you that this show does not have to do advertising for products you do not want to hear about. If Patreon isn't for you, another way to help the show is sharing the podcast directly or boosting its recognition on social media. If you share, comment or retweet a post from the History of the Germans, it's more likely to be seen by others, hence bring in more listeners. My most active places are Twitter, at Germans History, and my Facebook page, History of the Germans Podcast. As always, all the links are in the show notes. <laughs>